Dr. Kerry Otis. The last time he came on, so many of you guys were interested in what he does. And many of you actually took the class. Some of the ones that signed up were actually in my class and we did a showcase together. And I wanna give the opportunity again to do this because who knows, while when the pandemic's over, we may not have the opportunity to do all these wonderful Zoom classes or even have time for those that are having more time. But even if you don't wanna take the class, hang around for this broadcast because you're gonna learn some things that you might not have known about what it means to be funny and how humor is something that's really beneficial, not just for life, but for your businesses and for your relationships even. Please welcome Carrie Otis. Hey, Carrie, how you doing? Hi, AJ. It's a delight to see you as always. And uh, thank you for you know bringing me into your world. You have a wonderful audience. I've met a lot of them and uh, they uh, um, bring a lot of great stuff into the world and you, you connect me with this whole dynamic. So thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. It was so fun with the last class, seeing all the people that signed up, the, the brave, either the brave or the stupid, right? <laughs> I think there's a combination of that, that that's a great mix. Brave and stupid, often together. You have to, it takes something to break through your, your, uh, your limitations in life. And uh, I don't care which way, whether it's bravery or stupidity, whatever makes you yeah. You know, it, it's so interesting how so many people want to do this, but are afraid. And, you know, I, before I became a chef, I graduated culinary school in 2003. My job was an activity director at a retirement home, a high end one. And so I basically, you know, played with the residents all day, bingo, poker, blackjack, took them on outings to the movies, led the exercise class. And because I knew them better than anyone else in the facility, better than the administrators or the nurses or the, you know, the other people. I often gave the eulogies and I would often talk to people at the end of their life. And one of the things I learned is that the only regrets people had at the end of their life was what they didn't do. Yes, we're gonna always make mistakes and hurt people and things like that, but that was never their regret. Their regrets was always, what I didn't do. And I talked to so many people and like Barry, if you're watching that are so funny and they, they should be doing this at least once. And they're just so afraid, but you make it not scary. Number one. And also now on zoom, I mean, it's, it's, it's so much less scary than it's ever been is what I'm saying. That's true. And, and I, I look at, um, it's funny. My, my dad was a dentist for 40 years and, and he, I asked him, he asked, why don't you want to get into dentistry? I said, why would I want to look at people's mouths for all day? He goes, I never saw it as that. He sees it as a relationship of, of, of seeing what needs to be done and showing it to the patient so they're happy with the outcome. I don't see it just as stand -up, teaching stand-up comedy. I see myself as nurturing that little spark of desire uh, through that forest of fear, right? I see people reach out to me. They'll call me and say, I'm interested in your class, but I'm really scared. I go, but you called me. Let's take that thread that, that you are interested enough to, to poke through uh, the fear. And, and let me help you through that. So I'm, I'm not just a comedy coach, but I'm a, a kind of a fear coach, an adventure coach. I, I, I love taking people through that adventure. And there's so much you get out of that, that the, no matter what happens in the class, the fact that you called, that you went through it, that you took the chance, that brings you into a, a whole new area of bravery that you'll never be the same after that. Um, there's students of mine who never do stand up again, but they're, they're, they say that changed my whole business life. I can't tell you the number of people that changed their lives because they took the chance. And I don't even, you know, I don't think it was because of any joke they wrote. It was because they came in and took it. You know, it's interesting. The same reason you didn't want to be a dentist is why I didn't want to be a proctologist. But I'm bump. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's funny. I, I know people literally that have bungee jumped, that have jumped out of a plane. And yet, I mean, I would never do that. And yet, oh, I'm too afraid to do stand up. You can't die doing stand up. No, I teach you so many tricks, by the way, by the time you're done, if you have the right attitude, um, you don't, you don't even, losing is not even a, an option, all right? Uh, I'll give you one free one. Here, here you go. Uh, people see this as, because we've been ruined by schools and competitions and tests that, you know, you either do well or you fail. You're being graded. You're going to get a, you know, the, the judge holds up a 10 or a five and you're no good. And uh, if you if you don't look at comedy as a competition or I'm going to teach the audience I'm good and I'll win, if you look at it as a game, you're just going to play with them. You're you're playing with them. You never fail playing, right? And it's it's no harder than playing with a puppy or a baby. No one worries. I hope I do well. You just go hi puppy and they go hi, hi baby and they smile and that's it. That's you in the crowd going hi and they go hi. Well, what do you know? We're playing. No way to fail. It's all part of the game. 
And it's so much easier now because for me, the hardest part was in the clubs where there's drinking and people could ostensibly be drunk and heckle you. It doesn't really, I mean, I guess they could still be drinking at home on Zoom, but it's, it's, it seems like it's less threatening now doing it virtually. If you have control of the mute button, no one can harm you. Yeah, uh, that's true because that's true. If somebody heckles you, you just mute them. Well, I'm not aware, I've never been heckled on uh, on Zoom, but I have had a lot of people like uh, uh, start using their blender. Um, that's the only problem you really have. Um, so I was, uh, let's see, well, the things you said, you went out and worked in uh, the uh, retirement homes and worked with uh, people and took them on adventures. I find that really interesting because part of what you did then is got used to being a cheerleader for a lot of people. And I think it taught you how to uh, just do crazy things in front of people and not worry. Is that correct? Pretty much, yeah. I think that's yeah. a good assessment. And if you once you do that, once you do something really fun and weird, uh, you're no longer worried about doing it anymore. I I, I remember one time a, a friend of mine called me and goes, "Hey, you want to make a hundred dollars tomorrow?" I said, "Sure." He goes, "We're going to dress up in pirate costumes, go to Long John Silver Seafood, and uh, goof around with the, with the uh, pay." With the patrons like okay i was 19 i'll make 100 bucks and once you dressed up as a pirate and gone to a restaurant for eight hours nothing seems weird anymore if people go how can you get in front of a crowd and talk to her like i've dressed up as a pirate so in other words doing something out of your comfort zone makes you realize you're cool nothing bad happens so if you if you can do stand up i don't think anything ever gets you nervous like that again and I, if I can make stand-up easy for you and comfortable, then who knows what you can do after that? Absolutely. And I remember my cousin was a, an advertising copywriter, Leo Barnett, and he made his copywriters go to Second City and take improv because he felt it really made them more creative. Oh, absolutely. And I, I studied Second City actually with one of the creators of improv, Del Close. Uh, he's one of the, you know, the, the giants of the, of the, the form and uh, worked with him for a year. A uh, very inter interesting guy. You can learn from him. Um, uh, things. Uh, my friend and I that studied with him, we talk about him to this day, all the things that we incorporated into our lives from that. So improv, I bring a lot of that technique into what I teach. Um, uh, what, there's so much to, you can use in business from improv. Uh, do you remember, did you ever study improv? Yes, and I still do right now, you know, with the with the pandemic, it's it's harder. Actually, improv is harder online than stand up. But improv is my first true love. Uh, stand up still kind of scares me a little bit. But what I love about stand up is I love the process of being in class and writing the material. See, that's what I love even more than performing. So somebody could ostensibly take your class. And if they really chickened out, they wouldn't have to do the showcase, but they'd still have the fun of going through the class and working on a set. Right. Do you mind if I use you as an example of why I love what I do? Um, and, and here's the story. Have you you probably told people that you're you seem to be an extrovert, but you're really not. Right. You know that, that you're, I don't know if people believe that I'm an introvert because they see me only in public. <laughs> so I've known you for many years. Uh, I think since 2005 is when I met you, and. Uh, I know that you uh, make it look easy, that you look effortless up, uh, you know, uh, when you're performing either online or in person. Uh, but I know you work very hard to do that. And I, I think it's your proof that breaking through the barrier of fear leads to all sorts of amazing changes in life. Um, and people don't even see that you're nervous because I don't, I don't think you even are in the, in the way that you would be in the, in the past. You, you, you're not holding a lot of tension in the, right now, right? No. Well, because I, I, yeah, I have this button and it's red and it says end. If anything goes wrong, I just push the button and you all disappear. So you have a way to feel like I'm good. <laughs> and, you know, where some people would be terrified to do what you do. And yet you've gotten used to it. You found a way to do it. Uh, people ask, how do you how do you do stand up? Isn't that scary? Like, I found a way to be so comfortable on on stage. And I'm teaching that to students every day that they can learn that comfort level, too. Now, first of all, the, the first time up doing anything, you're probably not going to be totally relaxed. That's common. You're, you're in a new situation. You know, remember when you first drove a car uh, the first day and driver's ed, you're thinking, I'm going to die. And you're, you're holding on to the wheel with dear life. And, you know, you don't even see what's going on around you. But after a few months, you're able to really 
notice what's going on around you and you'll see the, the birds flying by and the weather and somebody you wave to, but you're, you're still driving very well. Stand up can be the same way. Um, and the same way with you, you can run these wonderful podcasts and still be thinking about other stuff. I know. So uh, we get used to it. We get relaxed. Well, uh, Valeria is watching and she says life happens outside of our comfort zone. And I was telling her she should take the class because she has an up and coming YouTube channel and it really will help you just even in public speaking, just stand up is like the epitome of, of the public speaking, which they say is the number one fear. And uh, I, I'm hoping that Thomas Allen, the owner of California Balsamics will take the class. And I think he is going to, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, gift out to your balsamics? Yeah, he's the balsamic guy, yeah. Thank you. If he's watching, thank you. I, I've got the curry and the basil. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he could, first of all, he's got really, he'll probably have great stories anyway, just being in business, but just the customer service aspect, because I think he'd, I think he'd have a terrific mind field of material to, to glean from just with his job. This is another thing I want to talk about. A lot of people, when they think about doing stand-up, they go, I don't know what to talk about, right? That's the first thing people wonder about. I don't have anything funny. Um, and I don't ever ask you to come up with something funny. All right. Because I think that's a very difficult thing to do. Like, what's funny? I don't know. But if I ask you what's, what's the problem you're having in your life, what's going wrong in your life, usually if once people think of that, they can't stop for an hour. They get yeah. problems. I got problems. This is a problem. This in business, my wife and my, da my daughter, my da and, the, you know, and the COVID. And suddenly they've got a thousand things to think about. Usually those are very relatable. Uh, Sher Sherry says, is, sar is, is sarcasm humor? Yes, it is. I, I, I think I would say, I, I'm not a, def you know, I'm not the definitive source of what is and what isn't humor. I think sarcasm is a form of humor and it's, um, it's a little tricky, a little, because you, you have to find if, if you're not in control of it, it can come, it can come out as overly dark, right? You know, some people are sarcastic, but it's scary. Right, like they say, and you go, "Oh, this this person's harsh." You know what I'm saying? Dr. Alan Goldhammer is, is very sarcastic, but it, but it doesn't come out mean. It comes out uh, to me funny. But I could see how if you weren't sure that the person was kidding, it might come. Right, out. Like Dorothy Parker uh, was a famous humorist from the 20s and 30s, and uh, she was sarcastic. I don't know if I I would be frightened to have a conversation with her. You know, if I was at the Algonquin Round Table, these people with our dark sarcasm might, might scare me, you know? Gina says, my daughter does not want to do any public speaking. Do you think stand up should help? Well, if she doesn't want to do public speaking, uh, stand up, here's, here's things that can, that can help you, even if you never want to do public speaking. Okay. Um, it organizes your thoughts. It, it teaches you how to connect with other people because stand up is about getting a thought across from your head to somebody else and knowing how it's going to land, all right? Um, if, and if you wanna be able to communicate effectively with somebody, and even if it's just one other person, then stand-up can be very effective for you. If you wanna get into sales, uh, I think it can be very effective for you. If you wanna be an educator, I think it can be very effective for you, okay? Um, uh, one of my students went on to become a very successful hacker. He's in, uh, you know what hackathons are? They give you these technical problems, you solve them, and then you, you do a presentation of how you solve it. Well, uh, this uh, uh, student of mine has gone around the world and won all sorts of uh, international competitions because he could communicate better because he learned about uh, stand-up. He, he just, I know that that's public speaking again. I lied. I didn't answer your question. Uh, but I, what I believe it is, it, it teaches you how to uh, effectively get an idea to someone else. Well, you know, the, so uh, where can you join? So I'm going to give the link right now, uh, Valeria, and anybody else that wants to join. I just want to let you guys know that Charles and I are taking the Tuesday night class. So if you wanted to be in class with us, you would want to take the Tuesday class. There is also a Saturday class, but unfortunately, it's during my live broadcast. So here's the link if you want to sign up. And what I want people to know, because Valeria said something really interesting, I feel butterflies in my stomach even thinking about taking this class. That's how I know it's something right for me, because they say you should do something every day that scares you. But guys, I I promise you 100% the class is not scary. Doing stand up, yes, it can be very scary if you've never done it, but there is nothing scary about being in a Zoom class because it's basically like a writing class. So there's really nothing to be scared about when you're in the class. 
the performing performing comedy and working on material is a different thing. So I, I, I've never met anybody be scared of the class. Have you? No, no. And you know, if, if you're in class with AJ, you're gonna have a lot of fun because she's one of the best joke writers I've ever come across. Oh my God, thank you. And that's that's really why I stay in it because I like if Valeria and Thomas take the class that we're in, see the fu funnest part for me in the class is coming up with a joke for somebody else. And then when I see them performing, I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I wrote that, I wrote that. That's where I get it. Cause I, the performing for me, it's all right. It's, you know, but the, the, pro, the creative process of coming up with the jokes and what's great about Carrie is he is the best writer. He'll never let you go up with a set that's not going to work for you. But first, supercharged plant-based lifestyle. Thank you for the super chat donation. And you know, the thing is, is I, because I know these people already, Thomas and Valeria, I can already, my head's already thinking about like what, what they can, what they can do because Valeria is, is it does what I do with education, uh, plant-based weight loss. She used to be diabetic and overweight and, but she's got this really, she's very pretty and she's got this Russian accent. She's got so many directions she could go. And, and I already know with Thomas, with his job and just the, I mean, he's known for his customer service and he is so nice, but and I'm thinking like what it's really like being nice to people. <laughs> that could be a whole yeah. thing, you know, having to be so nice all the time. I know there's a lot of people that like in their minds, are, um, but they're very nice on the outside. We have so much fun in class and also people learn a lot um, uh, about themselves. They learn a lot about each other. It's very enjoyable to just not have to uh, put up a front because class is about letting go of, of the worst, the worst things you're worried about anyone knowing, just tell them out front and then you have nothing to hide. It's Absolutely. A, you know, Gina says, my fear is that I don't think I have anything to talk about that would be funny. And that's the thing, because there's a difference between this is this is a really Gina, thank you for that question, because then Carrie, you can talk about there's a difference between being funny and doing stand up. There's a huge difference because we all know that that person, that uncle or whatever, that's like class clown that's funny at Thanksgiving, but they're not doing stand up. It's a, you know, you don't actually have to be a funny person to do stand up because stand up is an art where material is crafted in such a way. I don't, I'm not articulating it, but help me out here. It's an interesting point, and um, I agree with you very much. So, you know, there then they say, can you teach someone how to be funny? And I probably can't teach you to be spontaneously, continually funny, like Mel Brooks can just talk. You know, that's something that's very difficult to uh, in, in, in just give to somebody else. But if, if you have a, if you know how to bitch, if you know how to complain, I can, I can tell you where you're already being funny and just show you where it's already coming out of you and show you which parts of it to say in what order. And then you have an act. Most people I, within the first half hour of class have already touched on something that is an amazing topic for them to get into that they never would have thought that stand up like, yes, yes, you're already doing it. There's things you're already that you don't think I'm funny. No, that is funny. Everyone will love that. Do that. Yeah. Sometimes people, and, and, and I'm guilty of this too, and so is Charles, because the class is eight weeks and we do we work on the material for seven weeks, we do a showcase, and then we come back and we reconvene and, and you and you talk about what we did. The, the more you keep doing the material, then you lose hope, like you lose faith. They're like, God, that was so funny week one. Well, if you have the same people in the class and the same joke, of course, they're not going to laugh to the same degree. But that first class is so important because it sets the stage for well, your relationship with the other people. And people always end up being such, we, we become so close when we're in a small class, with, you know, eight people or things like that. But the thing you do in the first class where we do these rants, I mean, like I remember I was like actually crying. Like I was not trying to be funny. I was telling you what was wrong with my life. I'm like crying about this. And everybody is like, they're like, they thought it was my shtick. I'm like, no, this is my life. I, and it, it, I have it somewhere probably because Carrie, records everything and uh, and so that's that's really important though whether you're public speaking or stand up or you know in the plant-based world educator always record everything you do at least by audio because that's how you learn to be better Gina says can I give these classes to my cousin in another province or state absolutely the nice thing about zoom is that in in back in the day we all had to drive to Venice California or Hollywood to take a class with Carrie and sit in traffic for two hours and pay a lot more money because he had to rent a theater. And now it's like really, really, it's, I don't know, like $30 a class or so. And we can do it 
without wearing underwear. I'm not even wearing pants right now and see how funny I am. No, but it's great. You can do it at your home and there's a Saturday morning class that's 10.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. And then there's a uh, Tuesday evening class that I'm gonna take which is 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Pacific time. And so uh, Carrie had people in Europe that would get, they were getting up in the middle of the night to take the class, weren't they? And back in the old days, I had guys drive up from San Diego to take the class. So um, yeah, people put a lot of effort into doing it and now it's, it's easier than it's ever been. Um, and you know, you can also check out the first class for free. If you, if you just are chicken, uh, you can try out the first class and then join. Um, so there's really no reason to, um, if you're already thinking about it, you really have to do it. And why do I say that? Because we're talking about taking chances and, and, learn, and growing in your life. If you want to grow, you have to pay attention to that little tickle in you that says, that's interesting. I've always wanted to. And then you'll come up with a bunch of, but this, but that, but this, but that. And all of that's crap. All the, but, 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 but. What you need to listen to is the little part of you going, but I'd always wanted to. How often are you going to get, you know, I'm a comic with over 40 years experience. I've been teaching for 15 years. You know, I know what I'm doing. I, I've, I've been doing this with so many wonderful people and they all have these great experiences. Why not be one of them? You know, or, or it's a terrible mistake and you hate me and you'll never do it again. And it didn't cost you a cent. You know who wants to take the class, but I don't know if he can make it this time around is Dr. Goldhammer because he already does stand up. He just doesn't know that he's crafted all his talks into these things that you call, you know, premise, joke, set up, act out. He, he's doing it. He just needs, he wants to finesse it. So Diane says, the class sounds so fun. It is. What would I do with the skills I would learn? Laugh at myself? Oh, what's bad about that? My Lord, if that's one thing you got out of it, think, you know how much therapy costs for an hour? All right, to learn to lighten up about your life, to get a better attitude about how, how things unfold in your, in your life. You spend three, you know, $250 for an hour, all right? That's the whole eight week class practically. Right. You know, for, this, for 297, you get, you get this for a lifetime you can do to your, with yourself. Just learn to go, what the hell am I taking this so seriously for, right? So Gina says, I do want to do it. If we live in the house, do I need to pay for two people? If they're going to take Carrie's time to work on the set and the showcase, I, I would imagine, yes, if they're going to, because Charles and I each pay, we yeah. do it. In, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I've worked with other people who are in the same home, but they're both students. They're both, you know, they're both getting, it's like saying uh, you, you can't have, uh, it's not a lap baby. You're not getting on the plane and having them sit on your lap. Right. I mean, if they're there and listening, that's different. But if they're going to actually work with you, work on material and be in the showcase, then they would have to be enrolled as a student. Absolutely. I don't mind if somebody else is listening. No, I don't care. Yeah. Nice. I wonder what it is people are so afraid of. Well, everyone's afraid of what they've never done before. People. OK, here's what I think. We are not out of our comfort zone after high school. All right. In high school and grammar school, they make you do stuff because you can't like decide what classes to take. You've got to take this. You've got to take math. You've got to take science. In gym class, you have to play volleyball. You know what I mean? You're forced to do stuff you may not like to do. You may not like swimming, but there's a swim hour and you got to do it. But after high school, you specialize into whatever you're comfortable in and you never do anything out of your zone again. And uh, that's when we start getting narrow. We only do what we're good at. And then what we're bad at, we, we avoid even more so. Until you, you either marry someone who drag, you know, pulls you out of your shell or you want to date someone, you think they're cute, I'll, I'll pretend I like tennis. And suddenly you're playing tennis just because you want to date somebody. Uh, Gina is saying I could use it to make online dating more enjoyable. That right there is a whole great topic to do a whole rant about is how hard it is to, you know, be, you know, 60s and 60 years old and have to date online and cool. date during a pandemic and things like that. Yes. Yes. Suddenly, hey, do you, have you been here before? You don't want to hear. Yes. I come here all the time. You want to hear. I haven't been out of my house in three months. Like, yes, that's the best thing to hear from a date. Um, but, you know, here's a hint that, that's good for stand-up and good for dating, all right? You can tell the truth. And most people think they can't do it. You ever been on a first date with somebody and it's going badly? And you feel like, oh, God, do they know how bad this is? This is terrible. And then finally, one of you says, this is not working out well at all. And the other goes, yes, that's right. And suddenly you're both happy. Instead of being in a miserable situation, you're sharing a situation that was not going well. You go, 
yeah, this is the worst date ever. Me too. And now you like that person, right? It's the same thing with comedy. If you mention, hey, that joke didn't go well. The audience goes, he noticed. How cool. I like him now. They don't mind if a joke doesn't work as long as you both are in the same reality. If you're both in a date where you go, this is not working out, is it? How about you? Like, no, not for me either. How wonderful. Suddenly you're bonding together about how bad a date you had together. That's a lot of fun. So, oh, Valeria enrolled for the class. Hopefully Thomas by now did too. Now, another Gina says, will the classes be recorded if one can make the time and date? The classes are recorded, but you really can't miss, especially the first one, because it's just, you, you, you really, it's an interactive class. It's not, it's not like you just watch videos. You, you are working with Carrie every single class on your set. And so it's not really, if you can't make at least the first one, it's, it, you're not going to be up to speed if you don't attend the sessions. Right. Now I'm flexible. Like if you can't make the first Tuesday, you can come on Saturday and then, and then join back up on Tuesday. There's a lot of flexibility. I, I prefer you not to miss the first one. If that's the only way you can do it. I've, uh, AJ, I've, I've been able to, to get people up to speed. They'll watch the video and then I'll work with them privately for 20 minutes and get them up to speed so they can join for the rest of the class. But it's not the sort of thing you can routinely decide, yeah, I'll, I'll just do this on my own time, you know, at, at midnight uh, and I'll, I'll do it alone. You know, it, it's best to, as AJ enjoys, the, it's the community that we build, you know, and, and it is a community. You become really good friends with these people. And you become so creative because while you're you're working on their sets too, just because it just it helps you be a better writer in general too. Because when you're listening to other people, and it's just I don't know, it's just fun. I just love being in class. Honestly, I don't even care if I ever perform. I'm always like they're always making me Charles and Carrie, but I, it's, for me, it's it's like like for instance, I love baking cakes. I just don't like eating them. Well, it's so funny to me because no one would know that watching your shows. I've seen you do five shows, I think, over the years, and they're always amazing, and you're really good at them. The fact that they're not enjoyable for you, I can understand that. <laughs> I'm sorry that it's painful, yeah. but um, it has no reflection on how well you do at it. Um, it's, it that's, that's just the quirks of life. There are people who must have a great, you know, maybe they have a great time, but they're ne nowhere near as funny as you, but they think, I'm great. You, you, you go out there and go, I don't know if I enjoy this, but you're killing. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You guys have any questions for Carrie in general or stand up in particular or want to know about how he got started? Like, did you always want to be a, like, do you grow, like, do kids grow up and want to be a stand up? No, no. I like stand ups. I liked, you know, watching Red Skelton and I like watching, uh, um, the Smothers Brothers and uh, anyone funny. I love Bill Cosby. Sorry. Uh, I had his albums and um, I loved all that stuff, but I never thought I'd do it. It seemed much too scary. I like writing funny stuff. I wanted to be a comedy writer. And uh, well, the problem was that the blank page is very intimidating and I never got enough done or never, never was able to get it sold. And I thought, well, maybe I'll write some jokes and see if I can sell them, but maybe I'll try them to see if they're funny enough. And I tried it and I loved it. It was so much fun. I did it in Chicago. And then I just started getting work. And I thought, I'll give it a year. And within a year, I was making money. I was traveling all around the, the Midwest and I was headlining at comedy clubs around the, around the country. And then I got flown out to Los Angeles for an audition that Tom Hanks got. And they gave it, to, that was Bosom Buddies, the first show Tom Hanks did. And, but I was out in LA and I became a regular at the comedy store that night and uh, never stopped. Okay. So what, what I think is really nice about stand-up is it, like, the, okay, so you know, my husband worked in show business for many years as associate producer on a soap opera. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get a lead role on a soap opera unless you're a particular type, you know, physically, age-wise, you know. But with stand-up, you can be any age, any sex, any religion, any height, weight. I mean, you could have a disability. Like, the, it doesn't matter. It's like the one performance where you can really just be you. And the more you can be, in other words, you, you not only are not hiding your, your problems, you're highlighting them. You're, you know, if you're neurotic... You know, okay, like, let's say, AJ, you do a lot of stuff about being OCD, all right? And that's the kind of thing you never want to, in normal pu public life, we don't tell our problems. But in, in stand-up, we tell, we tell them, and everyone thinks we're fantastic. 
Did you see that OCD lady? That was amazing. You know, so we, we share our worst problems. And what's great about that is you'll never worry about them again. This thing that you were carrying, this weight you carried about, I better not let anyone see this. I better show them this. We switch that and stand up and we, sh we don't even try to impress people. We try to show them our worst stuff and then they love us more than we've ever been accepted before. Yeah, because I remember my very first appearance at the comedy store was all about having had four miscarriage. And you think like, how can you joke about that? Well, you do, because that's what, you know, tragedy plus time equals comedy. You know, if you see somebody trying to, trying to impress you, you think, what's wrong with that person? They're trying to snow me. But if you see someone come up and go, you know, uh, yeah, I'm pretty much balling up here. And they go, I like that guy. <laughs> Diane says, do you still, do you still travel and do stand up at comedy clubs? Uh, let's see. Uh, to an extent, I, um, my, my career goes like this. I, 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 uh, I worked in Vegas at Jimmy Kimmel's Comedy Club in October of last year. Um, what I do is very unique. Uh, when I travel in the summer, instead of going to comedy clubs, I go to workshops and gatherings where I'm the in-house comedian. So I'll go to a gathering of like scientists and writers and poets, and I'll do five shows to the same audience about what we're doing. So it's a very specific kind of comedy I do. Uh, but that's something I, I've worked out for myself over decades. Um, I don't do the clubs as much because uh, I did that for 20 years. Um, and that, that's, that's not where I excel at this point. Plus, I, I enjoy what I do. Right. And Billy says, is comedy always self-deprecating? Well, I, I think there's a line of, uh, of importance about that. You don't just beat yourself up mercilessly. Because if you're mean to yourself, people just start feeling bad. If you go, I'm terrible, I smell bad, I don't, you know, my feet are small. Blah, blah. If you, th that's self-deprecating, but it's not funny. It's, it's about being lighthearted about life. It's an attitude about n not beating yourself up, but being uplifting about your own problems. I got problems, eh, what are you going to do? Or I made these problems work for me. So it's, it's not hiding your problems, but it's not like complaining about them. And she also wants to know, did you ever train anyone who is famous now, other than Chef AJ? No, I just kidding. <laughs> um, I don't know about famous famous. I've, I've definitely worked with people who have gone on to do great things. Um, uh, let's see. But I, I can't think of somebody who, who would go, oh, you taught him? And by the way, every time I see someone who's famous, you find 100 people claim they gave him their start, you know? The guy who was the janitor at the improv claims, you know, I launched the career of uh, Robin Williams. You know, like, no, you were there sweeping the floor when he was being funny anyway. Um, the, you know, the manager claims to have done it. The show guy who owned the room claims to have done it. So I don't really claim anyone's success. But people I know who uh, have gone on to do very good stuff. There's uh, um, people in New York. One, one of my guys, Charlie Behrens, uh, took the class, did one show with me, all right? But he was working on his own doing YouTube uh, channel stuff as something he called the Mini Tonkwat Minute, which is a Wisconsin town. And he did that every day. And it was so successful that they flew into Wisconsin. His first show was me, was my showcase of the improv. A month later, he worked to 5,000 people in, in uh, Milwaukee. His second show was for 5,000 people in Milwaukee um, doing the, his character from the Mini Tonkwat Minute. So... He had a huge tour of, of Wisconsin after that. Francie Sue says, do you teach people who are doing stand-up how to handle being booed or bombing? That would be terrified to me. And how often does that really happen? I mean, you know, we hear about Michael Richards, but in general, how often does somebody get booed or heckled? I've been doing this 42 years. I can't really think of anything that was... I've been heckled, uh, but probably... I only remember maybe 10 times that, you know, and part of it was the learning curve of learning how to deal with it. Once, and I teach those to you so you don't have to go through it. There's a lot of ways to deal with hecklers. And uh, the first and most important thing, which I'd like to share with you is you never get affected by it. Your character on stage should never worry about it. In other words, they can't hurt you physically. As long as you don't take it seriously or personally, they can't hurt you. 
if someone yells out, you suck, as long as you don't believe you suck, it's just somebody yelling words at you. So if you, if you, if you, if someone yells, you suck, and you go like, well, that's an interesting thing to say. Or what if you said something like, mom, I told you not to come to the show. Exactly. So that obviously that shows that you're not affected. You're not worried about it. That's all the audience wants to care about is that I hope he's okay. And, and the fact that you're not affected uh, shows that that was not a real event. That guy didn't get to you. Um, the more you are able to fill your space on stage, the less people want to shout at you. They sense weakness and hesitation. And sometimes that leads to being heckled. Um, but most people just, they're, they're misinformed people who think they're helping the show. And if you can politely remind them that you're, you've got a show, it doesn't involve them, everything's fine, they can shut up now and enjoy the, the rest of your performance. As long as you let them know that without being upset, then you're good. And it doesn't happen in any of these beginner shows, never. It never ha it hasn't happened on Zoom yet. And I've been watching a lot of Zoom uh, comedy at, at different clubs. I haven't seen it on Zoom yet. My, my students have such grace up there because they're, they're just comfortable. We had a guy once with Tourette's last year at the improv, a guy with Tourette's started yelling out curse words accidentally, I mean, uh, uncontrollably at one of my acts. And they, they were so relaxed and so calm about it. It was fine. And then we went, you know, and got him out of the room uh, from behind, this, behind the scenes. What do you got over there? Who's talking? Let's see. Uh, Carol says, does Carrie have some favorite comics now? Oh, I, I, I mean, I love almost everybody I see out there is fantastic. But I mean, um, uh, let's see. Uh, but I, I watch a lot of new, new people and I don't always remember their names. So I, I do apologize for that. Um, and now whenever I have to think of somebody, I can't think of their names. Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Just, I'm always looking at new people going, that's amazing stuff. Uh, but I can't, I cannot pull up a name for you right now. Sorry. I can't think of my own family names when I'm nervous. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, Diane says comedy seems like it would help a lot with self-esteem. I think if it does, it's just because you feel good doing something that was difficult and that you did it just like when you, whether it's you do a 5k or do anything difficult. When you push through a new opening, it just gives you, it changes everything about you because you now go, I've, I've done that. No one can touch that, man. I, I think of all my students that they are, they're gods. You know, they have pushed through the, the gate of fear and blown off the gates and good on you, man. For me, it's, it's a very comfortable place. Stand up is one of my comfort places. I love knowing that I got a show that night. I, I, oh, I get to do a show tonight. I know it's scary for everybody else, but it can get to that place. But, but every time you push through that fear, you, you feel like a, you feel like a, a gladiator, you know? It feels so good when it's over too. Yes, it does. Yeah. Diane's, no, not Diane. Let's see. Oh, Jill says, why do some comedians find fault in their audience? And you have to be more careful these days now what you what you say to your audience, don't you, I think today? It's a mistake. I think it's always a mistake to find fault in the audience uh, because um, I, I think that's an, an incorrect move on, on any comic who does it. When comics are really, um, the ones I appreciate the most are ones that never make it the, the audience's fault. You don't yell at the audience. You don't correct the audience. They showed up. They're there. You know, listen to what they're saying. There's a, a wonderful comedian from Chicago named uh, uh, James Wesley Jackson. And I think he's the one who told us uh, back when I was first starting, he goes, always listen to a heckler. He may have something to tell you. And that means, he, you, you know, your, your zipper may be open. The mic may be out. The room may be on fire. Don't always think they're yelling at you and telling you you suck. If someone yells, we can't hear you. Don't go, you bastard. How dare you interrupt my show? Just go, oh, sorry. You know, reconnect the mic and on you go. You know, I, I hope Steve Middleman, who's already a well-known stand-up, will take the class with us because he says one of his best jokes ever came from a heckler. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes we that that moment can be so immediate and wonderful uh, that it, it does help the show. But I don't want to encourage hecklers to think, see what I did? I helped you. <laughs> That's funny. Not a, not a way to control the crowd, no. That is nice so funny. Nice to hear you. 
So there's a question how you got started. Um, how, did, how did you get started in stand-up? Well, I um, wanted to be a writer and I uh, lied uh, to a, an awards group and um, applied for a grant for, a, uh, for writing. And um, I submitted a scene from a play and it was the only scene I'd written. And then I got the money for the grant so I had to write the play. And then I needed a cast and my friend Joe and I who wrote it together uh, went to Second City and talked to the director about finding actors. And suddenly he asked us to join the, his, his class at Second City. Uh, and then we found new actors and did our play. And after that, we didn't want to stop. So we went and performed sketches at, at, the show, at the clubs in Chicago. And that was a lot of fun. And then I decided I want to do it on my own just because it was easier. Having, a, having eight people show up every night is, is hard to do for more than a year. So I went from a, writing a play to doing sketches to doing it on my own. And by then I'd already been to the clubs and knew all the, knew all the other comics. And, and it was easy to transition to doing stand-up on my own. And here's what I'll say, one more thing. Stand-up is easier than writing alone because you've got to get it done. You, can, you can't procrastinate. The show's, going to show, the show's going to come and you're going to get up on stage and you will do it. It's not like something you can put off forever. So if you have a problem with procrastination, stand-up is easier than writing your great novel or writing your screenplay. So if you take the class, you know in eight weeks you'll be on stage and it'll, it, you'll have accomplished that. So a lot of my students who are already good comics come to make sure they have a new five minutes every eight weeks. Yeah. Because when you think when you watch an HBO session that's an hour special, it's like, and, and I know how long it takes to do five minutes. They must be working really hard. It's a good idea to work on your craft every day for people that want to do it professionally, not just, you know, one time just to see what it's like. And one thing, uh, you mentioned that, um, you know, once you get on a good rant, your rant kind of just shows up. You know, it, it might be five weeks of learning and listening and playing games with me, but sometimes in one hour, you start ranting and you get to that sweet spot. And once you're there, it's like a gusher in an oil well. The whole thing just comes out. You're, the time you ran to that one class, that was your act. It took you a, you know, a few more weeks to get it back again, but you found it all at once. Really about just telling the emotional truth about what really is going on. So what we're doing during the class is kind of negotiating around the terrain and then we find your sweet spot. We drill in there and then when it comes up, we have the recording of it. So let's see what I, oh, you, you talk about like the games is this type of zoom that we're using is different than the one I use for my classes. Like I can't bring people on, you know, but could, could we do an experiment or just a, like an exercise so that they watching could like get their creative juices flowing just to kind okay. of. Yeah. Like uh, let's say now that now, now that we're in COVID, what game show does your life uh, resemble the most? Hmm. The game show that your life is like. Okay, let me think about that. You're not a game show person. Oh, no, I am. I am. Um, um, Jeopardy. <laughs> exactly. exactly. We're, all, we're all in Jeopardy now. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Our survivor. Um, that's another one there. Uh, you bet your life. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if we can come up with some more. Any more? Uh, you bet your life really dates me, by the way. For those Sale people. of the century. I got no money. I got to sell everything. Yes, exactly. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. Family Feud. Yeah. So pretty much every game show fits into uh, the uh, what your life in COVID is. So much, com so much of comedy is simile. Like this is like this because, you know. Right. What we're always trying to do is find a way to explain what's, what's going on for us in a way that other people already have experienced. So when they go, oh, my God, that's like that. It's very exciting to um, uh, to watch the energy jump from one thing to another. And what people don't realize is even if you don't want to be a comedian, like I'm really glad that Valeria is taking the class because she, like I said, she has an up and coming YouTube channel. And what the class teaches you is, is not necessarily how to be funny, like you're going to be this hilarious person now, but it teaches you a creative way to think funny so that even if you're doing like a PowerPoint, like I do based on a very dry subject like calorie density, that you can interject humor in it because people, it's been proven that, that it, those, well, not that many people have taken my in-person class, I'm sure you have, Carrie, is that people learn better when there's humor. When there's humor interjected, they, they tend to stay awake and they tend to remember things more than if it's just, you know, slide after slide after slide. 
Here's an idea that I think um, uh, is underlying what you're talking about, what I'm talking about. Um, I don't see that we're always trying to make our students funny. Uh, from the very first class, the first thing I try to teach you is you are already funny. And especially when you're relaxed, it comes out of you naturally. And what most people do when they try to be funny is they clamp down what is already in them. So what I try to teach people is how to relax, get to that place of comfort with strangers so they feel like your friends. And then you can be as funny as you are with your friends with strangers. All right. And when you're relaxed, people relax with you. You learn better. You, things come out of you that are funnier by accident. All right. So uh, learning how to not try to be funny is actually one of the things I teach. When people try to be funny, it actually clamps down on it. It's very interesting. If you go to a club on a Saturday night, there's energy in the room before a comic ever comes on stage. Show starts at 8, 7.45. The room is full of laugh. People are making each other laugh all the time. Then if a bad comic comes on at 8, the room is suddenly quiet. They've actually sucked comedy out of the room. So what we're trying to do as a comic is, not, is, not, is bring up beyond what the audience can do on their own. Relax. Keep them relaxed. There's already comedy in the room and add to it. All right. Yep, absolutely. And like you say, it's like, it's really like, it's like having free therapy when you get that stuff out. Just oh my God. Your sets. There, one of my students said, I can't afford therapy, but I love your class and it's cheaper. That's what I'm going to do. That's hilarious. Uh, Billy, and, yeah, go ahead. Billy says, what do you think about if comedians should be politically correct or not? Well, uh, it is, it is a, a a, a dangerous world out there because most of the things I've done were never recorded. All right. They're, they don't live forever. They were just in that room. I could feel out what that room was comfortable with and do with what I could. And I could push boundaries in that room. It's not like something that's living forever. Um, I truly believe that if you are come from the right place, you can say pretty much anything. If you're, if you're mean and angry and bitter, uh, even a compliment comes out wrong, but if you're loving, uh, but you, you can, you know, I, I, I can make fun of your hat if I know I love and respect you as opposed to going nice hat, which is a compliment, but it's full of meanness. All right. So I think if you come out with, get your attitude in the right place, don't worry about what you say. Yeah, how important is attitude? Cause when I think about comedians, the ones that we really really remember and really like they they're not bland like think about like um anthony jesselnik or um sebastian menace that can never pronounce his last name they have really strong and chris rock very strong wanda sykes they're not mamby pamby like oh you know i walked my they have very strong attitudes uh, which i love about that oh uh, you know chris rock wanda uh um what what i would say they they embody for me is their and I don't know if Sebastian is in that same category, but I see them as philosophers. They're basically, you know, Wanda is explaining life to us. Like you think this is going on, but this is what's really happening. Chris Rock does that too. And uh, I love that kind of revelation to, to me. I love hearing how they figured out what's going on in ways that nobody else considered before. It was right in front of us and they showed us the real truth. Uh, that's a kind of insight and bravery that I, I really respect in a comic. They As, always they have a strong point of view. They're never neutral. No, you want to you want to have passion in what you do. You know, like uh, um, uh, Louis um, uh, Louis C.K. No, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Black. Gossett uh, uh, Jr. No, uh, I think it's Louis Black. Uh, I'm getting. I'm again. Uh, his name is Black. Um, Jack I, Black? Not Jack Black. <laughs> oh, uh, uh. You know, the thing is, is now with Google, we don't know if we have Alzheimer's anymore. Who's Black? He, he's he's uh, just, he's incredibly, yeah. he, he practically explodes when he's trying to say his ad. Why is this happening? And it's fun to watch that. Yes. You don't want someone who's bored by their own ideas, right? Yep. Yeah. Gina says, how do comedy writers come up with all that funny stuff? I think because they work really long hours and there's a lot of them. 
Here's what I was, oh, you mean, how do they do late night talk shows? Right? I don't know, just, uh, you know, you, you there, there's a bunch of them though, aren't there? It's not one person writing for a show. No, a show has a, has a team of writers, of course. Um, here's what I would say. Um, I, ever since I was 10 years old, have been having these same funny thoughts. And it was a matter of realizing that's going on and writing them down. Uh, I don't see this as like, oh, I have to go write comedy. It's more like it's coming out all the time. I wanted, uh, what I want to do with my students is teach them to honor that. The difference between a civilian and a, and a real comic is we're both making people laugh, but the comic realizes there's value in it and goes and writes it down. Whereas, uh, you know, AJ, you might just say something funny during the day. You're like, huh, that was fun. And on you go. It doesn't mean it's valuable to you. Um, and what I'd like to teach my students is you're already being funny, pay attention to it and start to bring it into me. Anytime I have a fun, I have a notebook. Anytime I have a funny thought, I write it down. I don't know if it'll ever be in the set, but I, I write it down. See, that was, that was how I got into comedy really, AJ, is I was having fun with my, my buddy Joe since we met when I was eight and we made each other laugh. And I, I thought that was how everybody was. And then I went away to school, um, out of state. And then uh, traveled for a year and no one else was able to do that with me. So two years later, I come home and I go, Joe, what we were doing was important. I'm writing it all down from now on. And, and ever since that moment, AJ, I, I've got notebooks from that moment. And that's 45 years of just notebooks. Um, what's, yeah. the, what's the oldest student you've ever had and what's the youngest? Um, maybe 84, something like that maybe even 87. I'm, I think it was 84. Uh, youngest was 13. You ever uh, have any anybody like a priest or a rabbi? I bet they would be hilarious. I have Rabbi uh, Rabbi Miriam. Let's see, I have her book right near here. She, wonderful lady. Uh, she's taken my class about three times. Uh, so uh, yeah, Rabbi Miriam's a wonderful student of mine, very funny. Um, and uh, who else? You said a, a, a rabbi or a what? You ever have a priest or a nun in the class? I bet they would be hilarious. I've never had a nun. Um, and I don't think I've had a priest. I've, I've definitely entertained nuns and priests. I've done church shows. And I, there's nothing more fun than making a, a nun laugh in full habit. That's just, that's wonderful stuff. I performed at synagogues. Um, uh, Wilshire Boulevard Temple. I've done a number of shows there for Purim and all that. Yeah. That's neat. You guys have any more questions for Carrie or me? I'm, I'll am i be in the class, so you can join me if you like, or, you know, not. Um, but this might be the last class this year, though, right? Because you don't really like to do it right around the holidays. Yeah, it's too hard to get people uh, to show up regularly when Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and uh, uh, even Halloween. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, we finish up and then we'll start again in January. So don't don't wait forever, you know? Yeah, because there are small classes. I mean, there, there's only like usually, about, I think like eight people or so, something like that, right? Eight to 10, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise it would take too long to get through the class. You have such a, a, a wonderful group of, uh, of people that you're in touch with, that uh, you're outreaching. Uh, I love your students, you have a great group. That's because we're vegan and we're awesome. And uh, it's actually just being vegan in this world is a funny premise to do a, a to do a, sh a whole a set or, or several jokes about, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, um, it'd be fun to have more than one vegan do a, a vegan combat. Oh my, that'd be so cool. A whole vegan show. Wouldn't that be great if we just dominated the showcase? That would be so yes. cool. You, you'd own it, man. And then yeah. you, you become the specialty room. You know, like there's the the, the uh, great comics of, of, of meatlessness. Yeah. And you know, anything can be turned into in, in, into a, a set. This last um, last time I performed, there was a guy in the class who literally had COVID. And you think, oh my God, you can't joke about that. Well, I can't joke about the gentleman having COVID, but he can joke about himself and the experience. That's a big difference. Right, right. That's, that's the thing. You know, a lot of people want to go on stage and make fun of their wife or their husband or something like that. Like, no, never. You don't want to do that. By the way, what do you do, AJ? This is what you can look like now. 
I, well, they can't see me because when you're talking, because I'm, I'm trying to read the comments, but thank oh, goodness. Good. I was going like this. Oh, good, because I see you and I go like, does she know? I know. <laughs> it's so funny. The poor guests, they see me on my phone and I'm not really on my phone, but when I'm doing a sharing broadcast, you know. Oh, how much is the course and and, uh, and how many classes? There's eight classes, Billy, plus a showcase. And it's two ninety seven, so I think that comes to a little over like thirty dollars a class, and it's it's normally double when you have to take it in. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, it used to be five twenty five. That's ten years ago. So we're it's you can't get a better deal than this. I'm crazy to do it. It's crazy, Carrie. But the thing is nice. It's it's just it's just you you don't change it all the way you teach uh, on Zoom, but it's it just makes it a little easier for the person because you you cut out that two hours of driving, you know. I'm amazed how well it works online. I I couldn't believe it. We've done it now. Uh, we did it in spring. We did it in summer. I, I've done, I've done uh, two rounds of classes, and they've gone just splendidly. So never would have guessed it. I don't know how I missed that summer class, but anyway, thank goodness I'm back. Yeah, I think it was because I, I started doing this show regularly at 11 and I, I'm, all my Saturdays were booked. You had a book to finish that was- it, Oh yeah, and I did finish it by the way. It's coming out on the 23rd with Glenn Merzer. He wrote the book part, I wrote the recipe part. It's a, the third collaboration we've had together. It's called Own Your Health, 75 new recipes by me, 35 by my friends. So yeah, thanks for-, thanks for uh, saying that so I could plug the book, generically. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. When does the class start? Great question, Diane. The Tuesday class starts on September 22nd, which is my half birthday. And the Saturday class starts on September 26th, which is Bailey's ninth birthday. So either day is a good day. But if you wanna be in class with me and Charles, you'll be in the Tuesday class. Right. But even so, even if somebody takes a different class, we're all gonna be in the same showcase, right? Exactly. And uh, we're, we're partnering up with Flappers is an amazing club in Burbank, and uh, they ran our showcase that uh, AJ was on. Uh, so we have a great time. Uh, it's very professionally done, and uh, uh, I, I hope you guys feel uh, uh, like uh, participating. If you have any inkling at all, you really have to take a chance and, and at least sit in on the first class. There's no yeah. reason to do that. Yeah, I, what's, what they got? Nothing to lose. First class free, you know? Exactly. That's how, once you once you get addicted, how much fun you have, uh, then I own you, and then also, I'll ten thousand dollars. Also, guys, I've studied with probably I don't know seven comedy teachers over the years, and I always come back to Carrie because he is the best of the best. He will not let you fail. I promise you. He because if worse comes to worse, he'll write your set for you. If, I mean, he, he you're not going to need that. But I'm saying he is really such a good teacher and he's not going to let you fail. And you're going to really feel so proud after you've done this. And you're going to have the little clip that you can do on your YouTube channel or whatever you do, but it's just do it. You know, what, what do you got to lose? You know, what else you got going on right now? Unless you're on the front lines. What are you going to have this year? If you want to have an adventure before the year's out, this is the one to have. Yeah, when you look back on this pandemic and tell your grandchildren, what do you want to tell them? Yeah, I just stayed inside for nine months. Or, hey, I used that time to grow and to to take stand up and who knows what could happen, you know? Yeah, you know, Gina, you might end up meeting your husband in the class. You just never know, just do it. You know, I just want to end by saying, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Exactly. So this is great. Well, thanks, Carrie. I can't wait until the 20. I just hope I can stay up till 10 o'clock. I don't normally do that, but for you, I will stay up. If we get everyone that uh, signs up for Tuesday and they, they want to switch from six to nine, we'll do that, okay? That sounds great. Thanks, Carrie. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have a fabulous cooking demo from Debbie Chu from Chew on Vegan. Take care, everyone. Bye, Carrie. Bye, AJ. Thanks, everybody.